Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm giving this talk um, mainly because it was serendipitous that, are you going to, I'm just going to start talking, right, Suzanne? Okay. I was going to introduce oh, good. Okay. I, was, I, was, I came in late, so I just kind of jumped off. <laughs> so I was just like, okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Kim. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome, everybody. I'm Suzanne Sparge. I'm the director of 516 Arts. And Kim's talk today is part of the Heart of the City project. The exhibition is all around you and upstairs, and it's on view through May 3rd. Um, we're so lucky to have Kim here in Albuquerque working with us at the university and collaborating with the community on events like this today. Um, I would like to just tell you a little bit about her background. She arrived here in 2012 from the School of uh, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, where for the past 16 years she served as professor of art history. Uh, before and during her teaching career, she worked in the education and curatorial departments in museums and galleries. She graduated with a BA from Middlebury College and a Master's of Philosophy and uh, Master's of Art and PhD from Yale University. Wow, that's a lot of degrees. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, she writes, lectures, and teaches, teaches in the U.S. and abroad on representations of race and religion in American art. So without further ado, I'd just like to say thank you so much, Kim, for speaking today, and welcome, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how I got into this type of subject matter. Um, I, I guess I call myself a mural historian now, and uh, that has to do with a lot of interest in public art and then having um, le lived for over 16 years in an amazing mural city of Chicago. Um, and I have to tell you that when I was um, interviewing for the job here about two years ago, I took a walk down here, where they put me up at Hotel Park, and I was very excited to, on my walk all the way down into the central part of downtown Albuquerque to pass so many murals. And the first thing I thought was, great, I can still teach all of my mural classes here. Um, this is a play, you know, that was another big, big plus, you know, that I wasn't going to be completely going to an area where I no longer could take students into a city and to explore it and to find um, murals, because that's what I did for many years in Chicago. Um, so, like many scholars, when you start doing something that's not necessarily very traditional, um, that is somewhat in demand, then people start calling you more to do more work. Um, and so this talk today is really a conglomeration of a number of um, projects that I've been asked to do and have pursued on my own that deal with art in public spaces. So because, again, in Chicago I was teaching a class on the history of murals, and then I became more engaged in that community art scene, and then more people asked me to write more things about, about art in the city. Um, in oh, and I did want to have some New Mexico graffiti and street art. Um, I hope that maybe I can be asked back a couple of years from now. I'm teaching a mural class next year with Holly um, Barnett Sanchez, and um, we'll have a, gone out into New Mexico to see a lot more and to document a lot more graffiti and street art. Um, but I felt that it was definitely necessary since my bent here that you'll see in the rest of the talk will be a, a lot about Chicago and Los Angeles to some extent, um, that I at least should, should have found something that was local. And I love the first thing I um, put up here because I know that, um, that there are certain areas that are really rich in graffiti here in New Mexico. And this is what I found, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> so maybe I'll be able to give a really good talk about this in a couple of years. <laughs> Um, and then this is another one that I found that is really quite great. You know, you can actually Google, there's a site, a Flickr site that's New Mexico Graffiti, which was pretty awesome. So in 2011, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles mounted a historic exhibition, Art in the Streets. Did anyone here see that by any chance? I knew there's always someone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that drew record crowds to view the largest and most comprehensive survey of graffiti art ever to be mounted by a museum. 
spearheaded by Jeffrey Deitch, who in the 1980s was a gallerist who recognized the talent of many street artists, this show deftly presented graffiti in the US and abroad as an artistic moment, I'm sorry, artistic movement on par with cubism and conceptual art. The thing is, um, the thing is with this uh, movement that incorporated those and most other modern and postmodern movements. It wasn't just by itself. And that's one of the things being an art historian who teaches street art. Um, I have to say just an aside, when I started teaching my history of mural um, class at the School of the Art Institute in 1998, um, inevitably in every single class I have quite a few graffiti kids. And I, I, I kind of insult some of the other art students when I say this, but they were the most um, well-read in art history than any other students I have ever had. They can tell you in depth about Cezanne's color. They can tell you about Picasso's use of flattened space and describe cubism in a way that most students could never ever do, even after taking many courses with me. <laughs> um, so that was something that I always like to you know, give props to graffiti artists um, and street artists is because they really study. They study in a real old school way. Um, that you don't really find that much anymore, except among those artists. Um, my interest in street art, a more inclusive term of which graffiti is a part, stems from my work on murals in an urban context. Oh, and I should, I should just explain, this was actually the bathroom at the street art show in LA. Um, so one of the things that Jeffrey Deitch did, and I don't want to talk too much about it, it's a great catalog, I encourage you to look at it, um, is that he commissioned um, street artists from all over the world to come in and use the gallery as a space for them to do graph. Um, and some of the most amazing things that he did was to go back to some of those really early graffiti artists in New York whom he knew, who were quite old at this point, some of which are no longer around, and he had them come and tag the gallery walls. Um, so you actually saw not just reproductions of their work, but actual pieces on the walls. So this is by a French um, graffiti artist who often does um, girlfriend's names in big bubble letters. So it's a bit of a throwback to the bubble letters um, from the late 70s and 80s that you can find. Um, so I have been working in Chicago and working with the mural movement there. Uh, in 1960s, the, the mural movement started in Chicago and Many of you who know Chicano art, Chicano murals, or uh, murals in New York, you really have to also understand that Chicago was um, kind of a seminal place for this movement. Um, one of the works that you're seeing here is by William Walker, and he, uh, with John Pittman Weber, who has some connections here, his brother used to live in Albuquerque, uh, founded in the mid-60s, I think it was around 64, uh, the, the Chicago Mural Group. And that group really became a model for various community uh, mural groups throughout the country. John, for instance, uh, was often asked to come and consult with groups in New York and LA uh, because of the structure that they set up in Chicago. And William Walker, whose work that you see here, this is the Wall of Truth, from 1970, I'm sorry, 68 to 70. Um, one of the things that William Walker would do, and I'll show you a few more murals of his, is that if you notice down here, um, you can see that they're actual pieces of newspaper articles and magazine articles. And this was something that really fascinated me when I started seeing the documentation of this work because none of it survives. So that's another, another added layer, which could be a whole other lecture about, about street art and graffiti art and how it's ephemeral. Um, and so the documentation is all that we have left, as well as eyewitness accounts. Um, so this is how he describes one of the things that he started doing with painting murals and then putting actual newspapers, which I think of as being sort of a precursor to the wheat pasting that we see now that's really, really popular. And he wrote about this, I felt whatever was newsworthy, meaningful, I would change that particular space. I thought people should know about it. I would use that as a chronicle or a newspaper. That was what my walls were about. Um, so he began this practice, um, actually a year before this particular mural, 
than he did with another artist who is still living, named Eugene um, Edal Wade. Um, before that, they painted across the street this mural here that many of you may know of called The Wall of Respect. And I should say these, are at, these were at 43 and Langley, so we're looking at the south side of Chicago. Um, and this was one of the sort of seminal murals um, for racial pride, and that then kind of set off the various walls of, this was Wall of Respect, there's Wall of Truth, there's Wall of Heritage um, throughout the country. Um, frequently, he would paste up actual pages from the Sun-Times or local magazines, such as Ebony and International Black Air, concerning local and national events relevant to African Americans. And I should also mention that he went back and changed the bottom half of this mural a couple of times. And another thing I wanted to point out, you'll see that they're black and white photographs. So this already was using the idea of collage on a wall and as a mural. So there are photographers and um, about seven or eight other painters involved in this particular wall. This mural here, paint, uh, Peace and Salvation, um, was a major, as you can see, colossal mural that William Walker painted um, in Chicago. Again, it no longer exists. Um, in some cases, he would actually paint reproductions of headlines. Let me show you the details. So you're seeing here, down right here, that's a detail of these painted headlines that he would go back in and, and change um, as events occurred. The headlines that you see here allude to Kent State and Jackson State campus shootings. Uh, protesting students and the trial of the Black Panther, Bobby Seal. All of these events happen within a year of Walker painting this mural. And that's how he would kind of go back and, and change it. There's another detail of some of those. Um, and you can see here, um, some of those are taken directly from photographs that were um, that were in the newspaper that he was reproducing. In conceiving these mighty great walls, Walker was responding to both the marginality of the communities in which these walls existed and other elements of urban visual culture, such as billboard advertisements and gang graffiti that were so pro prevalent in these neighborhoods. His murals, and here's going back to a section of Wall of Truth, subverted the negative signs in these spaces. These murals were colorful, pro-black advertisements filling voids. He was selling African-American, um, selling African-Americans their history instead of fortified wines, cigarettes, and violence. Because Walker embraced his murals as ephemeral art that needed to be destroyed or altered to be current and relevant, and the subversive goals of his urban space, reclamation, these murals were street art in much the same way that public guerrilla art functions today. So this is another close-up of that wall where you can see, you're seeing about three layers of events in terms of his painting events. So he would put, up, put the newspapers over and then he would sometimes go back over and put more imagery over that. And that part of that was so people would come back, right? So you would be wanting to go back to this large mural and see more of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you, okay. Um, I just want to quote here from the architect and theorist Craig Wilkins, who has a very relevant quote about urban space. Um, in his book, The Aesthetics of Equity, Notes on Race, Space, Architecture, and Music, Wilkins addresses Foucault's concept of heterotopias by creating an alternate category to those of crisis and deviance one that is celebratory, particularly for Wilkins within marginalized urban spaces like the ghetto. And this is what he says about spaces that you're seeing here and how they can be changed. Celebratory heterotopias are created by spatial practices that challenge the very limitations and boundaries of crisis deviant definitions. The relations that construct the celebratory contest constantly work and rework the very authority of these particular categories. In the process 
appropriating and altering dominant spatial understandings. The performed communication, like the mural, of the, the celebratory of celebrating cultures challenges the dominant spatial paradigms that are essentializing e ideology and it questions its appropriateness as a universal aesthetic by demonstrating that alternate relations can be created. As such, it follows that alternate spaces can also be created. So what he's saying there with a lot of words <laughs> um, is this fact that you can inject a whole nother reality into an existing one. And that's what I always like to remind us that these images that I'm showing you that um, Walker and his various collaborators created on these walls, these were not buildings owned by him owned by the other painters, owned by most of the people walking by them. Um, so you have this intervention that's going on with the murals that's also giving ownership, it's kind of, kind of placing some ownership onto these spaces that were owned by mostly absentee landlords who lived in the suburbs or didn't even live in Chicago at all, um, or in the, in the state of Illinois. So that's what that text that I just read is really about, is this type of intervention in which these artists are able to um, present some sense of ownership by creating these visual spaces um, onto buildings that no one in the neighborhood actually felt they did own, even though they were living in them and using them. Poverty and disenfranchised human beings pushed Walker to paint and inform in the public sphere. In the center of the wall of truth, a sign reads, we the people in this community, that's going back here, let's see if I can get closer there, right up there in the upper right. We the people in this community claim this building to preserve what is ours. Walker summed up the purpose of this work in the communities in which he painted by saying, our murals will continue to speak of the liberation struggles of black and third world peoples. They will record history, speak of today, and project towards the future. They will speak of an end to war, racism, and repression of love, of beauty, of life. We want to restore an image of full humanity to the people, to the place, art, into its true context, into life. I always like to um, at least bring up that these large-scale use of paper media that Walker did with the paste-ups of actual pages from newspapers and magazines that you can see, actually, there. Then he would write over, we see black laws for all black people. Um, these images are, I see as antecedents, as I mentioned, to street art in terms of wheat pasting, but also some contemporary um, artists, and artists from the 80s and 90s, such as Adrian Piper, um, who, this is her Vanilla Nightmares series from 1986, which was somewhat revolutionary then because she was using actual popular media and making glosses on it with her drawings. Piper drew a provocative image of people of color over headlines relevant to them. They create relationships, both of them, Walker here and Piper, um, between the word and image that gloss the media excerpts with visual commentary. These muralists wanted their imagery to resonate with the neighbors and make them participate. Uh, to the right of uh, the section that has all the newspaper clippings on it, uh, there is a neighborhood artist was allowed to paint. His name was Ronnie Williams and he signed and that's his um, somewhat sort of flattened figures that you see there, right? Here. And these are images of, of musicians and um, heroes that he chose, so he was allowed to actually be a part of the mural and paint it. And you can see here that the muralist even made the site an ad hoc community center and provided kids with the opportunity to paint as well on easels. And this was all sort of Walker's thing, you know, that he really liked how murals could become these um, sites for community interaction, and that really was one of his main goals and he would do anything to make that happen. Um, and so you have something like the Wall of Respect, which was that first mural I showed you, 
um, one of the first murals from 1967, where for until it, uh, the building burned in 72, I believe, it was actually a site for poetry readings, for musical events. It even became a site where people gathered during, uh, for instance, the 1968 riots and the uh, unrest there. It became a place that people automatically went to. Um, to gather and to get information. So I think he was successful in terms of thinking of the mural as this community catalyst um, and an ad, ad hoc community center. Okay. These interventions were a type of, I like to call bombing, like graffiti bombing, in the public sphere that enabled Walker to broadcast a critical discourse he strongly believed his audience should hear and be a part of. As Vito Acconci has remarked, the end is public, but the means of public art may be private. So now I wanted to move on to this other, this is kind of my mashup of street art and public art presentation. So I was asked to write an essay for a show in, in Chicago at Columbia College that was um, almost like a retrospective show for the Gorilla Girls. And I thought that I would definitely include that today since this is I'm part of a series of Women in the Arts. Um, and my response to that was, well, what do you want me to write about? <laughs> you know, a lot has been written on the Gorilla Girls, and they're, they have become somewhat of a franchise for the last um, 40 years. And I wasn't sure how much I could bring to the conversation. And then I started thinking about the images that I remember about the, the Gorilla Girls when I was growing up as an art historian. And there were a few that I was fascinated about, which were the Gorilla Girls images in situ, meaning on buses, in, on, in the streets, on walls, right? And then I started thinking in terms of my interest in graffiti, and this was exactly when the street art show um, was being mounted. And then I started to think, well, you know, in some of those images, there's some graffiti. And I wonder what the dialogue, real or imagined in my mind, was between these feminist artists going and making these interventions, right, with their paste up posters all over Manhattan, and then there's all this graffiti there as well. A really, you know, sort of the parallel rise of the feminist artists, the Gorilla Girls, as well as graffiti in the late 70s and the 80s um, on those same walls. And so that's where I started looking at this. In 1985, those of you who may not have heard of the Gorilla Girls, um, were a small group of women artists in New York uh, formed what they called the Gorilla Girls. In direct response to the critic Kyniston McShine declaring that any artist not in the exhibition at that point called an International Survey of Painting and Sculpture that was at the Museum of Modern Art should re-examine his career. These women decided to talk back on the walls of Manhattan about their careers. Fed up with their marginalization, this handful of female artists started pasting outspoken notices about sexist practices in the art world and beyond on public and private buildings in Lower Manhattan. Often their posters appropriated the size, typography, and stark black and white elements of advertisements or public notices. Like illegal street artists, they worked in groups of two or three in the wee hours of the morning, often they bombed walls with rows of multiple posters. Sometimes they wheat pasted 400 posters per night, but not only in Soho, where their primary audience was located. Despite most of the posters disappearing within 24 hours, many people still saw and discussed them. And here again is where the documentation is a whole other element in this art history of street art. The Gorilla Girls targeted those walls targeted those walls um, where they saw the most gallery announcements, like you see here. In, the most, in most documentary photographs, um, the Gorilla Girls' large exhibition announcements were the first to obscure most of the existing street art on the walls. So you can see here that there's graffiti on the, way in the back, right, that's been kind of covered and covered and covered. Um, uh, layers of gallery ads are discernible around and beneath the gorilla posters with graffiti writers, whips and letters leaping out 
from behind them like colorful, colorful Baroque frames. The Gorilla Girls were not only entering into an aggressive dialogue with the art world establishment, but also with the street artists whose public forum they were appropriating. And you know, maybe at another time I could talk about interviewing some of these Gorilla Girl artists about whether they were aware of what they were doing in terms of entering into this street art space. The latter conversation was purely circumstantial. These feminist activists were not disenfranchised youth struggling against a bleak post-industrial plight. They were young middle-class women trying to raise awareness in the cheapest and most effective manner possible. In the 1980s, their protest posters utilized a space that contained many political transgressors outsiders, and as I like the term, culture jammers, all of whom were railing in their own way against the man. Of course, the man could make many, many, many forms at that time. As graffiti scholar Ethel Seno writes, quote, it is vital to understand how the uncommissioned intervention is a reflex against the hegemony of public space by the interests of the law over the psychological well-being of the many, unquote. Like graffiti writers and punk posters, the Gorilla Girls were also, quote, claiming territories and inscribing their otherwise contained identities on public properties. Within contested public spaces, these posters joined in the fray within the visual landscape of the Lower East Side. Here's some more. You have to look pretty carefully to see the Gorilla Girls posters. So, you know, take it all in there slowly. <laughs> because a lot of blood's going on there. More often than not, the documentation for these posters presents them as isolated graphic designs in a textbook or an article. In examining the few surviving images of the early Gorilla Girls posters as they appeared on the street, the way um, they would have been seen um, really engages an urban art history of all of these images. For example, let me see if I can move on to another one. To remain in the visual conversation of a site already crowded with posters, including those by the Gorilla Girls, Taggers, Thor, Buster, and Slim, and a handful of stencilers moved to the facade's outer, oh, this is the one I'm supposed to look, sorry, that's this. Move to the facade's outer architectural posts that frame the recess wall of the building. The raised striations here, that I'm talking about the pieces of architecture that stick out, um, were unfriendly to wheat pasting, as you can see. That's why they're empty. Um, <clears throat> were unfriendly to wheat pasting, so the taggers employed the horizontal bands almost as marquees or banners for their names. A large, heavily stenciled um, skeleton on top of Slim's tag offers a visual pun worthy of Gorilla Girl's wit. This framing gave the taggers the odd position of both dominating and caretaking of the art posters. The jockeying for space among street artists, gallerists, and the feminist voices is a map of Soho's gentrification in the mid-80s, when all of these people are fighting for a voice here on the walls. Ironically, legibility and identity have a curious relationship in these Soho photos. The taggers' names are obscured by their own wild style and by the gallery posters in which the names of the galleries and they're exhibiting, by the way, all male. I researched every single artist in the, that's being um, advertised in the, the gallery posters. Artists are large and clear. The real names of the Gorilla Girls are not even represented, of course, because they were incognito. This visual relationship among names highlights the com complex interplay between subversion and anonymity that both the Gorilla Girls and the street artists deploy in their urban interve interventions. So of course I'm talking about how taggers have names that of course are not their real names. Um, so you have these layers of identity that the Gorilla Girls were also doing. And still, um, interviews with Gorilla Girls do not use their real names. They choose names that are specifically well-known female artist in art history. So that's another way in which naming um, is part and very carefully used in this process. Here's this other one here. In another street image, oh, I think that one. Um, showing the Gorilla Girls poster 
On October 17th, the Palladium will apologize to women artists. Is that the right one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, sorry. I can't see really anything from this angle. Um, both protest, protest signage and exhibition announcements among layered clutter makes the very small posters the most legible and complete text on the wall. The only other legible texts are two looming tags, rock and catch. In street art culture, there are strict codes concerning when and why one artist may go over another artist's work, as you all know. Gestures of dominance via tagging, postering, or painting completely over a peer's work could incite violence. And I just want to you know, go back to some of those murals that I showed you, those really early ones from the 60s. They never got tagged, or very rarely. Um, even today, when they are in sort of disrepair, because Chicago has quite a few of these older murals that are um, carefully being um, restored, um, from their, mainly from the 70s, the ones that still survive, um, tagging has never really been a serious issue. And that is because of this code of ethics, right, with street artists. Um, how a piece disappears is crucial. Graffiti blasters, um, for example, um, are one thing. Someone else's tag or poster is another matter entirely. It is a public challenge. In a third documentary photograph that you see here, three posters, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum, which I think is one of the Gorilla Girls' most well-known image. Um, <clears throat> these posters remain intact, yet one poster has been ripped in half but, but retains its text. In blue spray paint, the Ang nude with gorilla mask has been covered by the tag Max K. Let me see if I can do my little fancy thing here. Oh, it's not working. There it is. <laughs> um, lines of the blue tag appear both under and over the paper fragments, recording the chronology of this set of defiant gestures. Kind of this this tit for tat between the tagger and the poster, the posterer, the gorilla girl. At least four writers responded to these posters on their, on their wall. And you can see, when you really look at it, you can see how some are under, some have gone over, some have come back. That's what I like about this one. Uh, the Max K, they, their tag was covered by the poster and then they came back, ripped off some of it and put it back. Um, um, as Kane, a, um, a graffiti artist in Chicago and one of my students, uh, one of those students that I was telling you about that was a tagger in my class, explains, quote, as a location accumulates more tags by more participants, it generates momentum and conversation among the graffiti community. It becomes a goal to see how many people can participate before it inevitably gets erased. How long can we live in this ephemeral? I'm sorry. How long can we live in this ephemeral moment together? Is the question. I love that. Um, the Gorilla Girl posters over their, these virtual conversation. I'm sorry. The Gorilla Girl posters over these visual conversations are the equivalent to the police shutting down a great party. <laughs> Hegemony is restored. Unquote. So that was all from Kane describing. I, I kind of showed him these images and we talked about it. On the contrary, the Gorilla Girls posters just join the party. One is clearly covered, Max K's tag, and he's returned and given it another dose of aerosol. The writer in red, the creator of the white paste up or small poster, and Gary Poser, you can see, go back to the bigger, um, also responded directly onto the posters themselves. The later tagger was clearly taking advantage of a surface amenable to a Sharpie, while one can only speculate why the red tagger respected, in quotations, the gorilla poster and tagged beneath it, just a little bit covering the edge, um, making sure that his or her serif is only onto the lower part. In another installation shot of these two posters, let's see if I still have that, here we go, go on to the next one, here we go. Um, the dialogue is literal in that someone responded to the question posed by, no, they just have to make worthy art in darker ink, and yo was written across boldly on the nude's buttocks. The poster attacked sexism and sexist struck back on top of it. 
As seen here, graffiti, art, graffiti artists were also beginning to poster or fly post in the 1980s. Spray can artists were turning to alternative methods such as stickers and stencils. In their book, History of Graffiti, Roger Gassman and Caleb Nealon explain, quote, the poster was in, a, in effect a simple, relatively low risk way to get up, meaning to get up, meaning to put your, put your work up in public spaces, unquote. According to graffiti lore, in 1983, writers DJ No and Tess of X-Men, another crew, created posters to combat the advertisements that someone was specifically placing over their tags. And this is how they described why they started doing posters. Quote, the originals were done by hardcore all-city ink and paint stained writers, DJ No and Tess X-Men, and because of their beef with the posters, <laughs> unquote. Other writers, like the well-known Shepard Fairey, oh, there's some more of those, it's gone. Uh, the well-known Shepard Fairey that you see here, and the French artist, J.R., among others, um, have now made posters, um, like the main part of their practice, in order to reach a larger and more diverse audience. Um, and this is, again, this could be a whole other talk, and I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with, with JR's work, and if you're not, just please watch his TED Talk, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so he's an international artist working with this type of large format postering, um, in which he takes on political causes around the world. Um, this one in particular is part of a series of female heroes, women heroes is what it's called, that he started in 2008, and this is the installation from a Kenyan village that you see here. Um, he's also done quite a bit um, with um, the Middle East crisis, as well as in Iraq, um, and he is basically only doing posters. But he started off as a regular graffiti artist. Um, as Kane describes this type of aesthetic engagement, their aesthetic wasn't exclusionary to graffiti it was sans serif type that was meant to be legible by the masses. Their campaign at the time was equivalent to what a large marketing agency would need one, um, hundreds of people to execute nowadays. So he's talking about these early poster campaigns by graffiti artists. There's also an extra layer of subversion in the act when it doesn't look like graffiti. There's a lot of privilege and oppression that arises when using graffiti practices to one's own promotion, but simultaneously distinguishing and separating the content that creates a cultural distance from actual graffiti making. A person wheat pasting a poster may get as little as a ticket if caught by authorities. A person caught with, with a caught spray painting can potentially wind up at Guantanamo Bay under the Patriot Act, and that is a whole nother. It's actually not that funny. There's, there is, um, there's certain, laws that were instituted under the Patriot Act that um, actually made keeping, oh, sorry, having a spray can, possession of something, um, like a spray can that made you subversive and possibly then could translate into, um, into some kind of treasonous act. Um, and that is again, there's, you can also Google that because that was a large conversation that happened right after 9-11 because a number of spray can artists were arrested um, and were arrested with confiscations and various things that happened using the Patriot Act as um, a way to arrest them, to argue for why they had to be, um, and done harsher punishments than just uh, being accused of, of doing graffiti. So that's another interesting thing to Google. <laughs> um, because the Gorilla Girls posters postered in the Arts District, oh, that's actually an image by Kane, who I was quoting, um, their activist moves jive very much with the street art of artists like Keith Haring or the clever, enigmatic, often indicting prose uh, or speech acts, as he called them, of Jean-Michel Basquiat that you see here and Barbara Kruger, Kruger circa 1982. All three artists strategically place their street interventions in Soho and in parts of Manhattan um, that related to the art world. Historians and writers still argue whether Basquiat's simple text and black spray paint, largely without any ornamentation or imagery, had more affinities with advertising than graffiti. The artist and his collaborators, Al Diaz and Shannon Dawson, created the SAMO tag that sometimes addressed issues of art world inclusion and consumerism. Um, 
One of the Gorilla Girls that I interviewed, who goes by Katie Kovitz, remembers seeing um, Samo's work at the time and finding it poetic as well as sometimes opaque. Kruger's use of ad design was also noted and inspirational to the Gorilla Girls. Um, so I have one more thing here. Well, that's another Samo. Um, In December 2009, the Gorilla Girls re-entered the conversation between fine art and street art by creating their first facsimile of a gray brick wall covered in brightly colored quotations, scrawled in graffiti-like fonts, entitled, Disturbing the Peace in Montreal. These were large vinyl posters put up all around Montreal, Quebec, to commemorate the 20th anniversary of a mass killing at Le Col Polytechnique in which a man who hated feminists shot and killed 14 female students. The Guerrilla Girls wrote, quote, we decided to focus on the history of hate speech against women and feminists from the ancient Greek, Greeks to Rush Limbaugh. We're bothered that it has always been okay to make denigrating public statements about women and shocked by the violence and abuse this language continues to provoke, unquote. For them, simulating graffiti represented public and uncensored speech and this is how they described it, quote, it seemed interesting to have the quotes scrawled on a wall the way hate speech often is. This poster is also one of the few the Gorilla Girls have done that has no headline, unquote. Um, in 2010, they brought attention to the exclusionary practices of art schools and museums in Ireland, and this is actually a detail of what you were saying there, um, with an interactive installation titled Guerrilla Girls All Ireland Project at set number 76 John Street in Kil Kilkenny. And that is this project. The artist installed a vinyl sheet of bright pink brick wall with handwritten and spray painted sexist phrases and statistics about the gender imbalance in Ireland's art schools and galleries. On the other side of the oops sorry, on the other side of the gallery was a blank wall in which visitors were encouraged to write their own responses. In other installations, the wall had been a blackboard to write and erase and write and erase, to continue the dialogue. With these posters, graffiti has become a trope, functioning as both a subversive brand and a vehicle for hate speech. So I'm talking about these. Um, which for me, I thought was a little ironic, you know, after I was kind of relating how they were started off doing this type of street interventions and now they've somewhat co-opted them um, with these vinyl fake walls with fake graffiti on them. It's kind of, you know, I guess incredibly post-postmodern maybe. <laughs> um, as earlier posters obscured and sparred with actual tags, these current posters replicate the open form of the street. Um, a quotation about acknowledging misogyny below the frame of the fake graffiti wall and the groups, I think that's, I think you'll see that here. See the website thing down there, see that. And the group's web address are the de facto didactic headline. The Gorilla Girl brand functions as synecdotally as the graffiti graphics. Inside the galleries, visitors own writings on the walls mirror actual taggers talking back and talking back and taking back ownership, all by fleeting of a contested space, the gallery. And where do actual female graffiti writers enter into this found dialogue that I was examining from the 1980s between street art and feminist poster bombing? While most writers do not make politicized work, more women graffiti artists do than male peers. Although that's changed, it's continually changing as graffiti and street art, like JR's work, is taking on a very different um, way in which it's being approached. Tags like Lady Pink, that's her there, Diva and Femme Nine often reflect the goals of getting up to represent skills equal to or better than the men. Lady Pink, or Pink, one of the first well-known female writers who started tagging in the late 70s when she was a teenager, helped the Gorilla Girls actually poster in Soho. Her description of that time sums up the dichotomy between the two worlds she inhabited, the street and the gallery, 
And this is from an interview that I did with her, because I really was very interested in trying to contact some of these early female graffiti artists, you know, since they were, how they were approaching seeing feminist posters about the art world, as well as going out at night and being in a very male-dominated graffiti culture. I wasn't a gorilla, but I knew them. I volunteered to hang an, an exhibit at the clock tower and to go postering for them at night since I had that kind of experience. The regular poster spots were hit, but due to the crowding of writers and posters downtown, everyone went over each other. The writers don't even notice that the Gorilla Girls existed. Only a small minority of graph writers were involved in the art scene, and we were mostly retired and not active. These were different worlds, the very well-bred artsy ladies and the rough underground world of boys and subway vandals. Their posters were considered a blank canvas to tag on, and that was it. I happened to be a crossover, being female, artsy, and a vandal, unquote, I love that. Um, the sexism Pink experienced as a writer raised the feminist consciousness that drew her to the graffiti girls, and this is how she described that. Quote, I went piecing deliberately with different groups so that everyone could see I could actually paint this stuff and not having some guy do it for me, unquote. Her constant negotiations with obscuring and revealing her identity parallel similar exercises in invisibility and power that the Gorilla Girls had deployed throughout their careers. Using her real name masked her graffiti identity among the artsy ladies, while she sought visibility among the male writers for street credibility with her tag, Lady Pink. The collective name and the Gorilla Mask have also offered the Gorilla Girls a freedom of movement between multiple spheres. So if any of you have ever seen the Gorilla Girls present, they can present in the mask. Um, oh, here's another pink. I have other female, right? Here's another one of hers. These are all pretty much older pieces by pink from the 80s. Other female writers approach their minority status as women differently. Claw, another early writer who now designs and sells claw clothing and jewelry, remarks simply, quote, I was a feminist before I ever picked up a can of paint. I painted because of that. I didn't attach a miss or lady to my name, nor did I paint with tons of hearts or girly flair. I wanted to bomb, so I did it just like anyone else. Being a woman, of course, feminine overtones would shine through once in a while, unquote. And I'll get to this in a second. A brief survey of websites and blogs by young female artists and collectives results in numerous citations of the Gorilla Girls. The Gorilla Girls' public lectures and their books geared towards lay readers have enabled many young women artists today to learn about those activists while growing up, as did the uh, graffiti artist Chicago, Chicago Lowy, and I don't have an image of her work. This isn't it, sorry. She wrote, I learned about the Gorilla Girls. Um, in my high school art history class, the only art class offered at my high school. They were very impressive. They went about their business by using a great strategy, forcing the public to acknowledge the fact that they were equal, unquote. Street artists and Gorilla Girls continue a legacy of subversion in multiple spheres into the new millennium, and the art world is acknowledging their pivotal roles in art history as culture jammers, conscious raisers, and taste makers. Now I wanted to just show a few slides in concluding um, of how graffiti aesthetic is also crossing over into the gallery. And this is one of my, one of my favorite images actually showing graffiti art, um, like some of the images in the show here at 516, tagging directly onto the walls. Um, here is the work uh, by the artist Shanique Smith, who has been crossing the boundaries of sculpture, painting, and site-specific installations in her art ever since she started making it decades ago. The Brooklyn-based artist received a BFA and an MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art in her hometown of Baltimore in 1990s. It's my hometown, too. <laughs> um, and she actually tagged in Baltimore. But she's much younger than I am. I didn't see her tags. Um, her work consists of colorful bundles of discarded clothing to abstract wall installations, which often include objects hanging or spilling into the viewer's space and luscious calligraphic marks that she makes with everything from paint to bleach and her body. Smith says that her use of text, quote, I think the act of writing can be ritualistic, like the act of binding. 
The wrapping and rewrapping of text and lines, lines around textiles or old clothes, also appear ritualistic, unquote. Smith was a graph writer in Baltimore, and, um, and she uh, also includes training uh, in calligraphy as well as traditional painting in all of her work. And here's another installation piece. This is actually a portrait piece that she did um, honoring Tupac Shakur at the National um, Portrait Gallery in DC. Rasheed Johnson is another contemporary African-American artist who uses a graffiti aesthetic in some of his work. He's also from Chicago. Um, in this spray painting of space onto a mirror, of course, makes the word a part of the space um, in the mirror that captures it in a conceptual twist. I saw this piece installed in a collector's home above his mantle in the living room, which enabled Johnson to capture almost all of the other parts of that collector's collection on the first floor of this gigantic home. So when you would look into it, you would actually see all these other works of art. It was almost as if he was taking hold of it, you know, this is mine, by putting it inside of his own frame. Um, it is as if Johnson's piece visual equips in this lavishly appointed interior, interior, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Due to time limitations, I am only discussing these few contemporary examples. Um, and again, as we can see in the galleries here, that there are many, many artists who are embracing the graffiti aesthetic. And I encourage you again to look at those various websites. There's also um, Street Art Gallery Los Angeles that has tons and tons of links um, and that's a whole nother like sidebar about ephemerality and the documentation of street art is that now the, the, the digital documentation and the way in which the, the internet is really an archive um, in a way that we've never had before. So when I was you know showing you those pretty poor slides of those murals from the 60s and 70s that's, those are digital reproductions of slides that were taken by people. Um, you know, photographs turned into slides that are archived, for instance, in a place like the Chicago Public Art Group. Um, but now we have this now huge archive that's being created for future historians to now um, be able to write about and know about street art from now until who knows when. Um, one of the final images I wanted to bring you full circle to one of my projects in Chicago. Um, this is a uh, no longer extant graffiti crucifixion that I encountered on my bike in Chicago. I have dubbed it devout, devout graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, though rare and fugitive, instances of street art with religious themes in Chicago exist. And some of you may know that um, I uh, finished a book recently that was on um, black public art and religion in Chicago. So when I came across this, this was like you know a jackpot for jackpot for me, um, especially since I was able to come back the next day. It was still there, and I took tons of pictures. Um, and then the next day, it was gone, um, pretty much torn down. Um, this so this is how this type of graffiti and public art relates to some of my own personal projects as well about um, street art and public religion in Chicago. This is very similar to a well-known graffiti tagger from the Bronx who goes by Jesus Saves and he does these simply on, on walls appear frequently but a handful of detailed paintings of, of Jesus also appear in them and he's been doing these not only in nationally, but um, also has been kind of commissioned to come abroad and to do these for the last decade or so. Um, I'm sorry, I got this one. I have one more, oh, that was supposed to be at the end. Um, the street artist B. Saves, who signed this piece here, erected a cardboard crucifix um, that you see here that's at the corner of Grand and Milwaukee. And I, I need to tell you about that because it's part of a huge graffiti and uh, public art corridor in Chicago. Um, 
what you're seeing in terms of the text there, uh, the words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, which is a biblical quotation, appears again and again in blues and greens and oranges and yellows and different sizes uh, that fill the background. And more legible reiterations of this text are written over the surface in silver marker. The crucifix form, slightly smaller than life size, is traditional in all other ways, from the Enri that you see at the top, above, in traditional in terms of, you know, some classical traditional Christian imagery for a cross, above the head represented by a jagged and abstract bleeding crown, to the rectangular shape of the footrest below the silhouette of Christ's bent knee and pierced side. Um, this vacant building that it's on, and it really was a, it sticks out in the corner where four or five different streets come together, um, Grand, Milwaukee, and Halstead, due to the previous graffiti of this, this vacant building, has been painted a dark oxblood, that's why it has this very bizarre dark background, um, providing a contrasting background for the crucifix. The brightly painted crucifix made the area look actually like an altar. So they're actually, when you would stop, about three different lights stop here. So everyone stopping at the red at the stop sign, I mean, I'm sorry, at the red light would be facing pretty much this corner, which is really fascinating. Um, this particular corridor is a gallery of sorts for street art with large pre-printed images adhered to the walls. Um, and they're large in terms of following uh, almost the entire wall here you would have various types of wheat pasting that went up there all the time. The painted gallery um, also had murals depicting flowers, shells, and other such imagery going as far back as 1971. So right next to this was a corridor from that historical period of mural painting in Chicago. Um, these elder statesmen of the nation years of mural, the mural movement preside over a corridor now known for its temporary wheat pasting um, artworks, and it also ha has an ad hoc exhibition site feel for it with this wooden area that once this was down, within a week, another piece of graffiti was up there. So this really, I'm trying to say how it really functioned very much as this gallery um, because it had such an active audience all the time. It was such a busy intersection. The remnants of wheat pasted stencil of a lurching zombie and a whimsical four foot long caterpillar like creature appeared on streets adjacent to this image that you see here. Um, so now I just wanted to finish up here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of cutting out stuff because we're running out of time. <laughs> um, glimpsed momentarily by pedestrians and drivers, this temporary icon reached a large audience, an audience not necessarily expecting to see an evangelical message at a stoplight. All of the images of street art that I have shown today vary widely in style, sight, and artist recognition, but they are bound by their valiant attempts to use street art tactics or devices to transform a space in which the political, politically charged trope of graffiti plays a significant role in calling out various gender, race, and class identities. Thank you.